So, Dominic, I'm glad to see you again. We got cut off last time, but um, we can continue on. And I'd like to start with uh, the point about that if you could get yourself into a relaxed, happy state, what else is it that you want? I mean, so I like those states. Uh, like I've, you know, I'm able to get into them sometimes. At the same time, there is something that I do like about the kind of more driven, achievement-oriented states as well. Um, what kind of driven? The, the more like kind of like driven, achievement-oriented states that are less kind of relaxed, but are more, or for me at least, I don't experience them as being relaxed, but are more like. Um, oh, you mean like, like a professional football player making a touchdown? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, for me, it's not football, but yeah. Right. Well, he likes it for a little while, and then he has to go make another touchdown at another game or later in this game, and then he'll feel good about that. Maybe having a big pile, dancing, spiking the ball, all of that kind of stuff. But that kind of uh, benefit is short-lived. And so he's got to go do it again. Because he's not happy and relaxed. He's goal-oriented. And the yeah, first jhana is... Go ahead. I was saying, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a tra it's definitely a, a trend. There's nothing, like, lasting about it, but it's still... There's also something a little bit seductive about it as well. Like, um, like... I, don't know, I go I go back and forth in terms of in terms of what I want, but um, but but go but go I I mean I see the the point which is that there's really no nothing uh, nothing really there except for like a momentary experience. Right. Well, you called it seductive. The fact is is that it's not that that's seductive. It's that you have been seduced into believing that it's valuable. The people who go to football games seduce the, the players on the field to those temporary highs. Okay. Yeah. But in fact, in a way, we could talk about it as skill development, but some skills are not all of that valuable in learning to live our lives in a comfortable, happy way. And so we go from one goal to another, wanting something, getting it. Sometimes we want something, we get it, and then we have to put up with it. And sometimes we get something, we love it, we take care of it, and then we lose it. So all the while, there's always dukkha or dissatisfaction at the end of it. The question is, is can we develop a practice or a skill that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, rather than disappointing in the end? Or like most meditation practitioners, it's hard work in the beginning, it's misery in the middle, and it never ends. But there is a way of getting the mind into a state that's good. And it can last if you keep practicing at it, developing the skills to go back into it and to maintain it. That is being in a happy, relaxed state where we don't have to deal with the society and its prisons and taxes and officials and any of that just they're not a problem if you start thinking about them you'll get yourself all worked up so it's better just to throw them out and be happy instead yeah, yeah i see I, I i no i mean i see what you mean it's like a um trying to change them is sort of like the same kind of achievement trip that the football players on um mm -hmm. 
well, wouldn't it be valuable and wholesome to achieve being happy without needing to do anything? Just be happy. Uh, yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. But what we're actually working with right now, um, there's a statement that the Buddha had made that's actually um, repeated, repeated a, a lot uh, along those lines, is, is that the teaching of the Buddha is profound. It's subtle. It's difficult for people to comprehend and understand because of the mind state that they're in. But we can, in fact, change that mind state if we practice correctly. And this is actually, you mentioned the word jhana. The first jhana is, in fact, that state. It needs to be well practiced so that you come back to that state over and over and over again. With the first point is is to remove the hindrances. What are the hindrances? That's all that we've been talking about. Prisons, politicians, judges, cops, taxes, money, all of those things when we're thinking about them wind up being hindrances to us being in a really good, happy state. And so we need to remove those hindrances from the mind. And that that's um, the issue of the hindrances is actually quite well known in all of the various kinds of Buddhism. Mm. And yet when it comes time to practice removing the hindrances, they forget all about it. Yeah, so I'm I'm curious, like, um, in terms of removing them like let's say you're let's say you're practicing something like anapanasati um when the when some thought comes up that's like you know associated with stress or whatever um like mechanically how would you how how would you deal with it because i mean like the sort of mahasi approach is to kind of like try and break it apart into its parts and make that the object temporarily actually that breaking it apart is just more dukkha. So, if it's a hindrance, then why break the hindrance apart and see the various qualities of the hindrance rather than just merely coming out of it because you know it's a hindrance. So, by by coming out, do you mean just like shifting your attention away from it back to the... Diversion... Diversion is one of the primary beginner's methods. Is to divert yourself to something else. And if you're wise, diverting it to something wholesome. To remove the unwholesome thoughts. Remove the hindrances. And to come into the present moment and think about the way things are right now. Because almost all of those thoughts, for instance, thoughts about prisons, guess what? There is no prison on this island. All the prisons that I think about would be old prisons that were came because somebody told me about it or I saw a movie or something like that. And so the movie, after I watched the movie and it stopped, it's now an old movie. And if I keep thinking about that movie, I'm just making myself feel bad. And so stop thinking about all the stuff, including pulling it apart. Investigating it is a waste of time. In fact, it's an unsatisfactory waste of time. And that we're wanting some outcome. Oh, if I pull that dukkha apart and examine it, maybe it'll go away by itself, and it doesn't. It's going to keep coming back. The question is, do you have the skills to deal with it when it does come up? Yeah. I might have mentioned this before, but here's one of the uh, delusions that we have commonly. 
we believe that a big tall tree hundreds of feet in the air has a root system that goes deep into the ground and the answer to that is no that in fact grave diggers know that by the time they get six feet down they're not going to find any roots at all all the roots that they have are right on the surface the same thing is true about dukkha there is no deeply buried dukkha even if it's old stuff happened when you were in diapers when it comes up it's not deep in fact if things were deep they couldn't come up the fact is, is that they're right there on the surface ready for the mind to wander into an unwholesome state because we've been practicing wandering into unwholesome states and so the way that we deal with this is with the eightfold and noble path most specifically is that we remember to look at what we're thinking about to remember to look at what we're doing that's the two twin things that in fact that's something that Mahasi method does do they teach the students to remember to look but and, and it's a great big but not looking at it in the right way we often conceptualize the dukkha rather than recognizing it immediately as dukkha and just throwing it out we see this dukkha and we connect it to that dukkha and it's explained this way and it's got that dukkha and then we go down the dukkha rat hole and the right way to do it is is to wake up and say hey this is an unwholesome thought let me change it let me distract myself let me distract myself into something that's really valuable and wholesome this happening right now to take a deep breath and relax and so so you really see no value in the kind of like like the kind of dissolution experience that can kind of the, the, let's say you're do let's say if you're if you're like in my own experience right like if i if i if i do break do kind of break things down in this way like after it takes a, a while like an hour or two hours whatever I do kind of come out the other side and end up in something that, I mean, to me, the, the way in which I experience it, like matches the description of like the fourth right. jhana and the suttas. So, okay. Well, basically, isn't that the same thing as having the football and running all the way down the hill, uh, down the the, uh, the the field, and then make the touchdown? Then you got to do it again. To where the real training of the Buddha has to do with training skill development thus one trains oneself is very very commonly stated in the Anapanasati Sutta gladdening the mind while breathing in and breathing out mindfully thus one trains oneself yeah, yeah. so yeah I mean I, I certainly the approach does kind of contradict what is said at least in that in that in that, in that sutta about that approach the actual teaching of the buddha kind of contradicts all of society including western buddhism that western buddhism does not teach people how to be happy it teaches them to remain in their goal-oriented state of oh I've got to go get this attainment I've got to go get that attainment I've got to have some nirvana to where nirvana will only come when you stop spinning the wheels wanting something and so the important point in fact the word that we could use that's really really valuable is the word satisfied satisfaction why because dukkha really is the definition of the word is being dissatisfied where does dissatisfaction come from so you can investigate dukkha left right and center and still be in a state of dissatisfaction you want to get rid of it instead of just getting rid of it now i've made mention of the fact before that the that the Western practice that they call Mahasi 
originally did not come from Mahasi Saladong, that his practices had joy built in. To gladden the mind, to brighten the mind, to become joyful. And yet you don't hear any of the uh, Mahasi teachers talking about actually making a change right here, right now. It's almost like a practice of postponed gratification. Is that not true? That when you get to the bottom of the dukkha, you'll be free of it? Yeah, I mean, I think the way the way it's framed by the kind of more sophisticated teachers is that um, is is that uh, ultimately you're on a kind of more primal level. Your your perceptual system just stops really just just learns to stop identifying with all this with with, with the with, with the with the six sense doors, and you just kind of all right. Let but go of how it. are you going to learn if you don't train? That it's not going to just happen on its own. That's magical thinking. Eventually, somewhere in there, we have to make the decision, I'm going to stop doing this and make a change. Well, I think they would argue that the, uh, the the practice itself is the is is the training that you kind of put yourself through enough that like the the ultimately you realize like okay there's really just like nothing there and then you kind of let go of it i'm not all right I'm not, here's I'm, the I'm, question I'm though, though, why don't we realize that right away why does it take a long time to realize it uh habit i guess you uh -huh. all right in fact not only is it the habit of most individual people it's also the habit of the meditation teacher So because they've been taking so long, they expect it for you to take it so long. And besides, they can make a living off of it. But the teaching of the Buddha is immediate, immediate success. The way that I say it sometimes is the way that Westerners are practicing it. It's dukkha, dukkha naroda is the way that the Buddha talks about it. But the way that this practice is dukkha, 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 let me look at that dukkha, let me take that dukkha apart and make two dukkhas out of it and connect it to this dukkha and that dukkha and dukkha, 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 and eventually I'll stop doing the dukkha. So why not stop the doing the dukkha right away? This, and this is the whole point about the hindrances that you heard so much about. And yet they don't teach. See that hindrance and throw it out immediately. Which is the actual teaching of the Buddha. And then be relieved. That, that uh, uh, hindrances are like uh, being in jail. You get out of jail free. Yeah, I think I think it's a bit the influence of like um, of, our, of psycho psychoanalysis too, right? Like where the, the the idea is that you're supposed to like face your pain, like in Western psychology, you're supposed to kind of like face your pain or face like the dissatisfactions of your child of your childhood or whatever, and then you kind of mm -hmm. learn to kind of accept. So that kind of gets a bit, that's sort of baked into a bit the narrative. It is. Uh, it really narrative. is baked in, and the reason for that is because the people who become psychologists are actually failed clients. That I went to a psychologist and I went to a psychologist year after year through my high school days. And so I still want to be free. Maybe the right thing to do is to become a psychologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's And so that's what you wind up with. I've got a little joke about that. And that is, is that the guy went to the shrink. And they did some what is called archaeological uh, psychological archaeology digging into the past mm. and and the guy comes up with oh i remember my mommy gave me a great big spanking when i was four years old and the psychiatrist says great that's it now we know why you're such an asshole <laughs> 
and neither one of them realized that mommy gave him the spanking because he was an asshole before the spanking. And so that archaeology uh, didn't do much good because he's still going to continue to be an asshole. And now he hates his mom, too, for giving him a spanking. That in fact, uh, what we need to do instead is stop dwelling in the past. Stop doing psychological archaeology. Stop digging. Just stop these hindrances of wanting things to be better. And start practicing. Things are already okay right now. But like I said, that goes against the grain of the way that everybody thinks. Here's another point that's really quite valuable for many students when they realize it. You've no doubt heard about the 16 uh, stages of insight yeah. that the Mahasi people use. They got that out of the Vasudhi Maga and the Pasiti. Uh, oh, I forgot how to say it. Padisambhiti Maga, which is an even older text. And if you really understand what that stuff is, you'll see that Starting with step six, they go into fearfulness, misery, disgust, anguish, and hit kind of rock bottom. That also has a great longing, just a longing, a great longing to get out of it. This is, in fact, a state that most people, when they start meditation, they're already in there and they just go into more longing hmm. deeper in their practice. And that's step 10, followed by what is referred to as a redoubling of their effort to get out of it. And then step 12 is the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path. All right. And so all of these stages, stage one through 10 or 11, up to 12, is ordinary practice by ordinary people doing ordinary things until everything falls apart. And then they start the noble practice. And so Achan Po has uh, advised me to start with the noble, start with the super mundane, start at step 12 of hmm. the 16 stages of insight. This is where you start. And all of that preliminary stuff is just money making operations. Because nobody gets any place in there with the practice until they come to the point that I've got to make a change. And then the practice starts. The real practice, the valuable stuff only starts when you've got to make a change and you know that you've got to make a change. That in fact, this goes with AA that um, because it was somewhat successful at getting people out of their alcoholism, judges for a number of years would sentence someone to go into AA. Yeah, yeah. And, and it didn't work. Why? Because the judge can't make you want to change. And it's only when people really want to make a change that they can make a change. And so Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa talks about it in the sense of it's a change model. It's up to you. Are you going to live out your old comma over and over and over again, evaluate it, pull it apart, talk about it? Or are you going to throw it out and make a change? Are you going to throw those hindrances out as soon as you see them? This is the correct practice of the Buddha. Just to wake up, take a look, and make a change. And we practice that over and over and over again until we get pretty good at coming out of our delusion, coming out of our desire and wanting, and develop the habit of being satisfied with the way things are. Yeah. And the eight, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I get what it, it makes it makes it, it it makes sense it sounds like overly like i'll just be totally honest like to to me it sounds very um almost like excessively excessively simple um 
It is. It is a, se- a, a simple thing to do. You have no doubt heard the Chinese expression that a journey of a thousand miles starts with a, a single step. Yeah. Right. But you have to make another step and you still got about a thousand miles to go. And you make another step and you still got a thousand miles to go. And step after step after step after step may not get you any closer to the goal, but you get pretty good at making your steps. So this is what we really are practicing. And ultimately, the practice is, is to give up those goals that we really don't have to step. That, the, that uh, this is much more of a metaphorical way of talking about it is to make a change in the mind. But we have to keep doing it over and over and over again. It's a very simple thing to do. And you do it right now. And there's going to be another now. As the clock ticks by, and then another now, are you going to do it again? And then another now, are you going to do it again and again and again and again? It's a simple thing to do that you have to keep doing, making a change. That's all there is to it. Now, one of the aspects of the hindrances is, is that we have words for it like anxiety. Yeah. Anxiety comes from unwholesome thoughts. Oh, well, what if that goes bad? Or what if this messes up? Or what if I didn't check the code? Or what if the flat tire, you know, all of this kind of what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. And sometimes those what ifs come up so fast because we're really good at them that we don't even recognize that it's our what ifs that cause our anxiety and our fear. And so what we can practice instead is telling ourselves there's really nothing to fear right now. Any dangers that you've ever had or ever will have were in the past or in the future. But right now, you're safe. But most people don't feel safe, even though the reality is is that they are safe. Got the door closed, there's nobody there, there's no alligators, there's no spiders, there's no snakes, there's no mafia, there's no cops, there's no SWAT team, there's no mother-in-laws, and you're safe. There's no emails to write. And just sitting and being comfortable, and people have the old anxieties and the old fears will come up, but they come up not as a reality, they come up as a habit, the old tendencies. Question is, can you wake up and see that and make a change? And start telling yourself, oh, let me take a deep breath and I can breathe that anxiety out. Let me watch it dissipate. Let me tell myself how comfortable and relaxed, how uh, safe and secure I really am. I'm not, it's not dangerous right now. So these are the kind of wholesome thoughts that we can substitute for the kind of thoughts that give us uh, anxiety. We can have comforting thoughts. Instead of what uh, there's two kinds of thinking that uh, uh, is is commonly understood in psychology, and that is critical thinking or a critical (laughs) parent versus a nurturing parent. So can you come out of your analyzing critical nature? And start comforting and nourishing yourself. Everything's going to be all right. Everything is fine. And then we can analyze from that position to recognize everything really is okay. And then the anxiety will come back. Never mind. I see that anxiety. Take a deep breath and recognize that, hey, there's nothing really to be anxious and upset and uptight about. Let me just relax again. And then again, it'll happen. And again, we make a change. But most people will stay in that state of anxiety. Um, Henry David Thoreau calls it the state of being in quiet desperation. Most men live lives of quiet desperation. They're full of anxiety. They're almost desperate. 
and we can see that and make a change. Now, one of the things about the practice of Anapanasati is, is that it's a complete practice. We have the body, the feelings, the mind, the mind's objects. If we can start changing the mind's objects and start changing our attitude and changing the mind states that we're in, the place to start is by being in a safe, comfortable place. Mostly that means in seclusion, being away from other people. So the Buddha recommends go to the forest, go to the foot of a tree, go to an empty hut, go to a pile of straw and sit down and bring mindfulness to the fore, which basically means start looking at what we're doing, start looking at what we're thinking so that we can make a change to it. Now, when I say that, I'm covering, gosh, more than a dozen suttas. There's a long description of the hindrances, both in the uh, the Satipatthana Sutta as well as Sutta number 39 in the Majjhima Nikaya. But most of the Mac practitioners are, and meditation teachers don't insist that the students drop those hindrances as soon as they arise. They say, oh, well, if you analyze them someday, they'll stop. No, they won't. They won't stop until you demand that they stop and throw them out as soon as they arise. You throw it out. Why should you wait 15, 20, 30, 50 years of meditation practice before you start practicing correctly? Why not start practicing correctly right from the get go, right from the very beginning? And so what we want to do then is get the body in a safe, comfortable place. So you're in an empty room right now. You're in an empty hut right now. So that means that you're actually safe. The body feels safe. Why doesn't the mind and the feelings feel safe? Is because the mind keeps bringing stuff up that is not safe. But the reality is, is that there, you are safe. And so in a way, you're dreaming. You're dreaming up manufacturing problems that in the right now, they don't exist. So let's start looking at what does exist. The reality is safe, secure, comfortable, relaxed. So let's practice that. Let's start thinking about, yeah, things really are safe. Things really are secure. Things really are comfortable. Things really are relaxed. And we keep thinking about it that way. And when the hindrances come back, hindrances of doubt, hindrances of wanting something, hindrances of trying to get rid of something that we don't want, restlessness, worry, agitation, all of that, and say, wait a minute, let's just throw that stuff out and be comfortable and happy and secure right now. This is the new skill that needs to be developed is everything's all right. Everything's fine. No worries. We can do this. Now, in this way of speaking, we're actually practicing both the Eightfold Noble Path and Anapanasati together. That as we practice Anapanasati, it's for the fulfillment of the, uh, uh, the Eightfold Noble Path. And it's also for the fulfillment of the Satipatthana, which actually is the remembering or the, um, the of the foundations and what are the foundations remember the body remember how we feel remember to look at what we're thinking about we're looking at what mind states that we have and when we continue to mm. practice that the the eightfold noble path turns into or transforms or becomes through practice the seven factors of enlightenment, the Sambhojana. So what are the factors of enlightenment is the practice. And the beginner, they have to practice because they've got no skills. But when the skills are already developed, now we have unremitting sati. Anytime that something comes up, hot dog, I remember to look at that. Hmm. And when we do remember, then we can investigate. 
Now, what the Mahasi method does is they teach you to remember to investigate and investigate and investigate and investigate and investigate until you get fed up with it up to here. It's dangerous in there. It's terrible. It's miserable. We got to get out of this. But that's not the teaching of the Buddha. The teaching of the Buddha starts with three points, not two. To wake up, to remember, to take a look, and then hot dog make a change immediately. Right, noble effort to throw those hindrances out. As soon as you see that there's hindrances there, you do not need to analyze them. You do not need to do any archaeological investigation. If when you're digging around in the mine, the roots are on the surface. They're not deeply buried. You don't have to go digging deep. You just dig into it. You see it's a root. Got it. There it is. Pitch it out. So we start with wholesome thoughts. The wholesome thoughts would be everything is OK. I'm not afraid. I feel safe and secure. I feel comfortable. And we keep practicing that and pretty soon we come up with the real point and that is satisfaction. <clears throat> now I'm actually what I'm doing is that I'm using the Pali dictionary definition of the word sukha because it's right mm -hmm. there in the, uh, the suttas right there in the Anapanasati Sutra, the sukha is to be developed through gladdening the mind, changing the mind, getting the body comfortable and relaxed, and then sukha will arise. And what is sukha? The feeling of safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied. And voila, you're already there. You're completely enlightened. Why? Because the whole teaching of the Buddha is dukkha, dukkha, naroda, which means dissatisfaction, see it and come out of it. Well, if you're in a state of sukha, you just came out. Congratulations. Right now, no dukkha. Why analyze dukkha when you can just throw it out? Have you ever heard of the term pack rat? Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, that's what most humans are in their own mind. We're pack rats. What does that mean? That every time that we see an old newspaper, instead of saying that's old news, I don't need it anymore and throw it out, we say, oh, maybe I'll need that someday. And I put it back on the stack and pretty soon the whole house is loaded down with old newspapers, old books, old trash, old garbage. Or imagine the chef that um, he's cutting his food and putting all of the waste and all of that into the garbage and the um, uh, his his waiter or his servant or whoever is cleaning the kitchen starts to pick up the trash to take it out and the chef says, wait a minute, there may be something in here of value. Let me dig through my garbage. That's the Mahasi method to dig through the garbage. Wouldn't it be better for the uh, the chef to, even if there's something valuable in there, I mean, he can be mindful when he throws things into the garbage. He doesn't have to be check. He just throw the garbage out, take it out. So this is the real practice of the Buddha. The real practice of Anapanasati is just to make a change right here, right now. But then the next moment, look at it again. Make a change right here, right now. Throw it out. Look at it again, make a change, throw it out. Then you look at it again. Wow, this is nice. OK. Then redouble that and do it again. Over and over and over and again, this is the practice of both Anapanasati and the Eightfold Noble Path. And pretty soon we get into that state of Sukha. Free from Dukkha, satisfied. Things are good enough. Things are good enough right now, the way that they are. And over time, something new happens, and that is we begin to get the confidence that this skill works. I don't have to say, oh, well, I got to do something now because way off in the future, something might happen. And we get instead the attitude of, hey, if it does, I'll be ready for it. If I can get myself happy right now when nothing's happening, I'll get the skill so that when something is happening, I can still be ready for it and be happy. Eventually, 
you're going to die. Can you practice to get ready to be happy when you die, or are you going to be miserable when you die? Most people are miserable. Why not practice to be in a good state? So that if you do die, you can do it. You can die in a happy state. Be in heaven. So don't worry about the future. Worry about can you practice it right now over and over again and confidence will build. Yes, I can. Remember. To throw that stuff out of the hindrances and make a change. And confidence grows. The Pali word for it is sada, and the Sanskrit word for it is shraddha. Sanskrit tends to put a lot of R's in words. Dharma, karma, nirvana. Oh, yeah, I noticed that. And the original language doesn't have those R's in it. It's dhamma, kama, nibbana, and here, shraddha, or sada means to have confidence. This is also on the Eightfold Noble Path. So as waking up, taking a look and making a change happens over and over again, <clears throat> they run and circle around each other and the skills that we have develop accordingly. So that the suit, uh, so waking up helps us to remember. Uh, to look. Making a change helps us to remember to look. Looking makes it easier to change, especially if you can see it early, it's easier to change. It's easier to start when is when the for instance like a leak. If the leak is can be seen early, it's easy to take care of. But if it gets so bad that the whole pipe is burst, now you've got a big flood you've got to take care of as well as the repair of the pipe. So yeah. These things work and run around one another, and then this new thing happens, which is the confidence of, wow, I could do this. And the wow is the most important quality of this. This is where satisfaction becomes success. I could do this. I can remember to be happy. I can remember to be satisfied. I could do it. And then we get into that wow state, which is referred to as pity. Badly translated, by the way, is rapture. The word rapture already has rap built into it. And the Christians have stolen that word and taken themselves to heaven as soon as something magical happens, which it never has. And so it's not a, it's a terrible translation, but pity actually means instead having a high or a wow sensation. It's like sukha is pleasure and uh, pity and pity sukha is a really going of it. I like it. It's good. And that this is what's developed in Anapanasati, but also the Anapanasati that's developing this is exactly the first jhana. The first jhana is number one, free from hindrances. So people who are analyzing dukkha never get into the first jhana. They'll go and still spend years thinking that they're trying to get a fourth jhana and they can't even manage getting into the first jhana. Until they gotten the, to the point of I've had enough of this and I'm making a change. And then they could start practicing Anapanasati that will do, develop eventually into removing of the hindrances followed by the sukha, followed by the pity, and all along they keep applying the, the, the mind to the wholesome, applying to the mind to the wholesome, applying and applying and sustaining and being able to get ourselves into this state and stay there, not allow the hindrances to come back in. That's the first jhana with those things. Freedom of the hindrances, the development of sukha, the development of pity. Apply that, sustain it, and keep it going. And there's also a sixth addition to it, which is relaxation. We relax the body, we relax the mind, we come into a state of relaxation. 
And that's how we practice over and over and over and over again. And we can do that while driving a car. We can do that while watching TV to remember that I don't have to think about that TV and how bad things are on the TV. I could still be in a state of happiness and joy. Maybe I'd be even more happy and joyful if I'd turn that TV off. And just relax. So this is the practice. Now, if you can get yourself into that state to where you feel satisfied, confident, uh, you feel like that you're the winner, that you're the boss of your life, what else do you want? Magical powers? People who want magical powers are already victims. They want the power so that they can take revenge on somebody or prove how great they are. But if you already feel really great, you don't need magical powers. That in fact, this strength of mind in a way for most people is a magical power. But it's real. It's not a magical power. It's just real power. The power of being satisfied. The power of being on top of your own world. This is what the super mundane or uh, Lokatara or um, you've heard the term sitting on top of the world. Hmm be above the world, to be above all of our problems. How do we get there? By practicing. One moment at a time. There's also the old story about every one of us is an emperor of our own pile of dirt. I love the story. Everyone's an emperor of their own pile of dirt. But most people, the emperor is buried under their pile of dirt of all those unwholesome thoughts and all their past, all the crap. And then the Mahasi people are trying to claw their way out of it. Meditators, people who go to shrinks as psychologists are trying to claw their way out of it. But really it's an attitude change. So, would you rather be buried under your pile of dirt, clawing your way out of it, or merely just sitting on top of your world? So, begin to have the thoughts of, I've already arrived. This is good enough. No place to go. I've gotten it. These are the wholesome thoughts that we can develop. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think I think it 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 makes it makes sense. I think the way the way in which like the more kind of like uh, vipassana oriented practice was sort of like is like kind of sold or the way or the way I sold myself on it was the um, like I don't know maybe like maybe it is like sort of lack of confidence that one would be able to maintain that kind of. Uh, uh, relaxed state in like kind of stressful situations so like it's like okay well then just like learn how to like completely disidentify with whatever's happening to you so that you don't uh really um you don't you don't buy it you, you don't buy into it because okay you, yeah i i guess i I'm, I'm not really being that articulate but i you can understand i think you understand what i mean um all right okay well that's also valuable we have been talking about mainly just distraction yeah Okay, but you're mentioning something else that's also quite valuable. It's not me. It's not mine. Those old memories don't belong to me. I'm making myself miserable by owning that stuff. Here's an example of it. Uh, We've got a dog here that was bitten by a snake a couple of months ago, and she's doing fine, but uh, the, uh, the area that was in the worst taste burst open and she's got a gaping wound on her hip my friend comes by and he is squeamish he Hmm. sees me sticking my finger in it and putting salve in that open wound and okay why do we do that is because we see that open wound is mine that's me that's opened 
Okay, when we see someone else being stabbed, we don't like it because we put ourselves me into it. I don't yeah. like being stabbed, therefore I don't like seeing other people getting stabbed. Another one would be identifying with a political party. And every time that political party gets something good, we feel good. And every time the political party uh, loses something, we feel bad. Not reckon, remembering that political parties are up and down, up and down all day long. And here we go. Every time we hear something good, we feel good. And every time we hear something bad, we feel bad. We're on a roller coaster because we identify and attach to things that totally don't belong to us. Like going to the football game and we see the um, the uh, the guy on the field running the touchdown and he feels really happy and half the people in the stadium are jumping for joy because they identify with him. This is my football team. He is my player. And the other side of the stands, they're dejected because they have the same um, uh, thing. Oh, it's the other team that is mine. And mm. so my team is being harmed by this guy making the touchdown. So we can come to become completely neutral to sports because they're not mine. Let those guys play if they want to play. Let them run all over the field and spike balls and do whatever they want to do. But it's not me. It's not mine. Nothing is worth identifying as I, me, or mine. Now, you use the word disassociation. That means that you're already associated with it. That's the Mahasi method, looking at the dukkha. A much better way of saying it is, is that's not mine. I never associated with it, so why should I disassociate with it? I'm not associating with it, and I'm proving to myself I've got nothing to do with it. It's not mine. Mm. Yeah, 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 no, it kind of just presupposed that the, the the craving is 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 there, and you have to solve the problem of the craving or like of the the grasp. You don't to have it. to solve the problem; is only that you see it and make a change. The second noble truth is greed, ill will, and delusion. The delusion is is that I should be attached; I should like it. And when we come out of that delusion through the practice here of Anapanasati of coming out of those hindrances, not mine, don't belong to me. I'm good without it. I'm okay. I'm already all right. I can feel safe, secure, comfortable, and satisfied no matter what happens because it don't belong to me. Nothing belongs to me. Even your body doesn't belong to you. Jesus mentions that you can't change your stature one whit. Another way of looking at it is, is that old people want to be young and young people want to be old and everybody's dissatisfied at the age they actually are. And yet they can't change their age. They can't change things. And, pe is, and actually there's a word for it that's referred to as narcissism because of an old um, myth in Greek mythology or where the, the guy was in love with the way that he looks. And so women are taught to be narcissistic, to change the way that they look, put on rouge, put on makeup, fix your hair, do something to make yourself look better so that you'll feel better. Yeah. Where in fact, you can just feel better and it doesn't matter the way you look. In fact, the monks, um, because of other circumstances, like mirrors being really valuable, the monks didn't have mirrors in the time of the Buddha, and now the modern monks, they don't bother. So in that sense, you could say that, well, if I'm ugly, that's other people's problems. They're the one that have to look at me. The only time that I see I'm ugly is when I look in the mirror, and I don't look in the mirror. If I don't look in the mirror, I don't look at it. It doesn't matter whether I'm ugly or not, or the body is ugly or not, because the body is not me, not mine. Mm. And so back to that point about ignorance or delusion. That if we can wake up to our greed, we can say, oh, that's just a hindrance. Let me throw that out and be satisfied and happy right now. Let me be comfortable now. 
And we have to practice that over and over again because those old dysfunctions, those old dissatisfactions, those old attachments will come back. And if we can see them, we can say, I'm out. I'm happy now. Don't bother me with your trivia. So okay. that's the real practice of the Buddha and getting ourselves into that state of, wow, this is really great. Is the key. That's all we need is to get the self, get ourselves back into a state of I'm OK. Everything is fine. The body is ugly, but I'm happy. The body is getting old, but I'm happy. The body is sick, but I'm still happy. Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa actually says that when you're sick, when you're old and sick, that's a really good time to practice. But most people, when they're sick, oh, I couldn't bother meditating. I feel so bad. And in fact, that's the best time to meditate. Oh, I feel so good that in fact, we can begin to control the body in a psychosomatic way to bring ourselves out of our tiredness, to bring ourselves out of our sickness with the thoughts that are wholesome. Rather than, oh, poor me, which is an unwholesome thought, we can have wholesome thoughts about, don't bother me, it's okay that the body is sick. Okay. So this- um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a different, it's definitely a totally different um, like perspective. Um, It's the Buddhist perspective, but it's profound, difficult to see, hard for people to understand, and you'll go away and practice, and then you'll forget to practice. Over and over again, you'll forget that you don't remember. But you have to practice remembering that, in fact, this is why the Buddha gives gives the option of mindfulness of breathing in long and mindfulness of breathing out long because every breath that you take then is two points of sati. To remember that this is a long breath, to remember to relax, and to keep practicing, to remember to do that with the mind also. And over time, the body that is comfortable, relaxed, uh, safe, secure, and the mind that is relaxed, comfortable, safe, and secure will kind of gang up on the feelings, what's called a pincer movement. They'll grab them like this and close in on them. And pretty soon, we begin to feel safe, secure, comfortable. Even for an old practitioner, it only takes a half a minute or so to come out of our anxiety, come out of our worries, and come back into everything's okay, everything is fine. No problems, no worries. Hmm. Okay. Um, Can you practice that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I already have. Uh, well, I've tried. I've tried based on like other instructions that you, you and other people have given. Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, it kind of. It it's. Uh, it 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 works while it's working, and then. Uh, I do find myself getting like dragged into everyday activities to the point where I like uh, kind of, I'm, you know, it's not like I'm like practicing. Every ah, day, but, but can but, but, you what? remember to change that and drag yourself back out? <laughs> uh, when you are buried under the, the woes and the problems of life, can you say, hot dog, I don't need to do that. I can sit here and be happy instead. Yeah, for the for the most part, yeah. I mean, like the 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 what I do for my like career like requires a lot of like high level mental processing where it's not like uh, you, I kind of need to get like absorbed in what I'm doing. I I notice that after if I, especially if I do it for like three or four hours without really stopping, when I come out of it, I'm in the very kind of like tense, uh, like kind of like craving oriented uh, state, and it takes me a while to come out of it, like probably an hour or so. Um, well. 
that's because you're not practicing it. If you practice it, it wouldn't take so long. You can say, oh, I'm up tired. I've been working. Never mind. I can relax right now. <sighs> and just relax. Okay, so you think it, it's just something that you get better at over time if you practice more? Uh, well, it's a skill to be developed. Yeah. Just like people who learn to play a musical instrument, they have to put the effort in. Hmm. And they start making music, but they have to keep putting effort in it. And pretty soon they get one piece memorized, one piece of music that they can play. And so they become satisfied with that, and then they'll play more. Most students who ever take piano lessons and quit within a year or two is because they don't like it. So you have to get yourself into a state of liking to practice Anapanasati. Then, in fact, I would highly, highly recommend to take the word meditation out of it. Okay. Because meditation has the connotation of doing something to get something, to doing the, the uh, a, a lot of work to get little results over a long period of time. But Anapanasati is instant gratification. Instant, at least in the sense of 30 seconds. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, uh, recognize that you like doing it, that you like telling yourself everything is OK, everything is fine. You like remembering to do that. Yeah, that I mean, I do. I do like it, so I, I, I don't have an issue with that. Yeah, um, don't have an issue with that. Um, but you can see the value and the benefit. I mean, right now we're just still at an edge. Uh, 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 an intellectual level. But when you actually get the experience of, wow, this is good. When it actually feels good. Then you know you're making progress. Yeah, I mean, I, I tried it earlier earlier this morning um, and I would say I got to the um, uh, like kind of tranquility stage after like five minutes or five to mm -hmm. seven minutes or something like that. Right. So. Doesn't take long, even for those who are unskilled at it. Five minutes, 10 minutes at the most. But as you develop the skill, it's going to be five or 10 seconds. Yeah. And you're saying that and you were saying that like, you don't really see much value in necessarily trying to keep yourself in kind of like formal in a formal sitting in that state in a formal sitting sense for more than 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but beyond that, it's just like uh, spinning your wheels. The mind gets dull. It's not so bright. But we can't tell it. I mean, if you were flying in the airplane and you're in the thick of the fog or the clouds, you don't know what speed you're going. You have to look at the ground and get some sort of reference. And that's the mind, too. The mind can get dull and drowsy. And we don't even know that it's dull and drowsy because we don't have any reference. OK. And so it's yes, better sir. to be alert. It's better to be awake. Mindful, paying attention. Making a change. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I guess what what is there to do really? Just I can keep practicing it like a few times a day. Um, mm -hmm. Is every time that you can remember, and you can have triggers. We'll talk about some triggers the next time that we talk. Okay. All right. But every time that you remember, you can take a deep breath. I mean, you watched me on this uh, video. And dozens of times I've taken a deep breath and just relaxed. And I notice that all the time I'm talking about breathing and relaxing, I haven't seen you do it yet. Oh, uh, I have. I mean, I, I have a bit, but uh, I think maybe not in a super. Uh, the way to tell way. is by are your shoulders rising? Are you taking a deep enough breath so that the shoulders will rise? 
and then Paul with the out breath. Okay, I'm, we'll do it now. Yeah, let's do that now. With the thoughts, everything is okay. Easy going. Oh, just relax, relax with that out breath. And then the mind will wander away. Never mind. Come back. Start again. Start again. And when the mind wanders away, never mind, start again. We don't have to fuss at ourselves. Oh, we lost it. Just remember to come back and start again. To make a change. And in, in like kind of more formal practice, would you say like the it's better to do the, the, the longer breaths? Because I mean, you see different teachers say like, a lot of teachers say don't do longer breaths at all, right? Um, Pardon? I, the su- a lot of, like this, the sutta seems to say that like you do you, like you start with long breaths and then you and then you shift to short breaths and, and watch the short breaths as well. Would you say for now just do only long breaths like in the formal? Until you have a direct long strong habit. Okay. Okay. It's like why choose why switch musical instruments if you haven't even learned the first one okay the, okay this is a skill the training then in fact there's reasons for the short breath and that would be when you really need it you need the effort you need the energy you need it right away <sighs> Get the body really energized, tingly alive, but you can get that tingly alive with the long breath also. Okay. Okay. To make yourself feel really good. But what most people do is that they stop. They stop watching the breath. They get high and then they like it and then they forget about it and the mind wanders away. Just like is what happened to you. You broke out into speech when you could have been having a ball. So this is the way that we practice. And we'll get some anchors and some other things the next time. So I would recommend that when we finish this video, go practice right now. Okay. All right. So we'll see you. All right. Thanks. We'll see you in, see you in a, a couple of days or next week or whenever. But go practice. Get okay. some success. Find that you really like doing this. Everything is all right. No problems. Wow, everything is okay. Come satisfied. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks for the time. We'll see you. All right. See you.